compute heavy algorithms on. And so when you think about what's happening in the mobile hand space, consumer electronics marketplace, uh, you see this uh, gold rush of activity around handsets and the development of better uh, camera performance, which is driving companies like Apple and Qualcomm to develop very, very powerful SOCs um, that can, can bring computational imaging you know, to their sensors and really improve the low light performance or a variety of various things, as well as some in integrated AI functionality. And so what we are seeing as an industry is the opportunity to leverage the investments that people like Qualcomm and others are making in these very powerful chips and making them available to other industries besides the mobile handset manufacturers. And we're here to take advantage of that. So when you think about a mobile processor, you're talking about something that's in the hundreds of millions of units, but it costs around $600 million to develop a current generation SOC. And no one outside of the mobile handset space really represents enough business for uh, any company to go off and develop this kind of product. And yet now these companies are making these products available into adjacent markets such as, as ours. And so we are well positioned because we have the software, the algorithms, the IP, and now we have a very uh, swap optimized hardware platform to run on. And so we can bring these into all our particular article, articles where size, weight, and power is very important, such as the UAV market, security cameras, military systems, robotics, those types of things. So, and what we're seeing is a huge, almost tripling of performance from, generate, from one generation to the next. And you can see here in this chart, uh, I've got the three current Qualcomm uh, typical SOCs that are available uh, in the marketplace today. The 845 came out in 2017, that's a 10 nanometer part. Today, most people are developing on what's called the RB5, that's a seven nanometer part. And the next generation Snapdragon is a four nanometer part. And with each generation, you know, the uh, compute power here expressed in trillion operations per second basically triples with each generation. So the next generation Qualcomm part is 48, 48 trillion operations per second, and that has a, an effect on power and value. So we can get 10 tops per watt, which is great, um, and we also get lower cost. So for Teledyne FLIR, we are we've made the decision to support uh, our customers by building li offering libraries that are compiled to run either on the last two generations of NVIDIA, so that would be the uh, Xavier processors and the Orin processors, or going forward on the Qualcomm, on the RB5, and the next generation uh, Qualcomm chips. So our libraries are basically broken down into two types of libraries. We have the thermal ISP, and there, most of that's around improving image quality beyond the raw sensor uh, capabilities. Um, there's a variety of noise reduction, super resolution techniques, image fusion, all sorts of automatic gain control functionality that typically have fairly high compute demands that now we have a very swap optimized hardware platform that we can run those on and make a very, very compact flow. And then on the AI side, it's there really to help with decision support, whether it be man in the loop or something more autonomous. A lot of our AI activity really began and has been funded primarily and focused on automotive as we try to bring thermal imaging into the automotive marketplace for ADAS and emergency braking systems. And then we have a, a framework in which we have the ability to control all our microservices and things like that, you know, to stitch everything together into an application. So this is a list of our digital products. Again, across the top, you see the hardware platforms. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, that is the current SOM that one of our divisions has developed on a Qualcomm RB5. It's extremely small. It's for a small UAV platform, but you can see just how compact, you know, something with 10 tops of performance can be. And 
there's no reason why the next generation shouldn't be in a similar sort of form factor. But again, knowing what our customers are, are integrating and working with, either whether it be Qualcomm or their own uh, uh, NVIDIA hardware, we support those uh, with, you know, with specific libraries to run on those uh, platforms. In the Atlas library, then again, you have uh, automatic gain control, noise reduction, super resolution, radiometry, turbulence mitigation, and image fusion. In the uh, perception stack, we've got the object detector. So that is the ability for the camera to put a bounding box with a label and a confidence score on objects that we have trained to see and detect. Fine grain classification, and then of course, in the taxonomy of, of object detection is just a level up where we can actually be more specific about the object that instead of an object class, we can be very specific, such as instead of saying military vehicle, we could say T-72. We have also uh, object trackers, uh, single object tracker, multi-object tracker, MTI, um, and we also have fused inference. And then again, we have the Nexus framework for, you know, for support at the application level. And then we have a, um, a data lifecycle management software, a data set development tool called Conservator. This is where both ourselves as well as our customers and the people we collaborate with can upload data so that we can train our models, and continue to train and improve our models with more and more and more data. As we get into more and more applications, we can get into specific use cases. Today, I would say in total, we have about 4 million annotations in our data set across the various applications, the ground ISR, counter UAS, air to ground for UAS payloads, security, and automotive. Again, these are the libraries that we offer, automatic gain control, super resolution, turbulence uh, removal, electronic stabilization, and then on the perception side, object detectors, fine grain classifiers, and a target tracker. And the way in which, as a system developer, you might look at this, um, you have most of our customers are looking at both channels, visible and thermal. So in the pipeline, before we get to AI, we may want to apply certain thermal ISP functionality, where in the visible spectrum, that's handled directly in the visible light ISP that's on these various uh, silicon processors. And so we can apply a variety of different pre-processed pre uh, analytics or image processing features to the, to the thermal stream before we go into, into, uh, into object detection and inference. And we have developed a dev kit based on a Hadron, which is a, a dual channel, very high resolution, visible light camera, 64 megapixel visible, 640 by 40 uh, thermal uh, on an RB5 dev kit. And that's on display in our booth if you'd like to come by and talk to us about that. So the first video I'm going to show is our turbulence mitigation. This is a mid-wave uh, therm uh, thermal stream. And you can see on the left the effects of turbulence, which is quite typical in a sort of ground plane situation. And on the right side, you see the, uh, uh, the resulting correction of the turbulence. And here's our super resolution. You can see that we're processing, we're zooming in our 640 by 40 image into a, uh, into a 320 by 240, and then we're applying the super resolution Resolution, you can see the uh, dramatic improvement in, in image quality. And, and this happens with up to as little as one frame of latency. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nice application. And then we have the ability to do image fusion, which allows us to mix and blend. And there's a whole variety of controls about how much of each channel you might want to bring through. So this is also very nice in certain applications. This is our, our, our noise reduction functionality. So the top is our, is our uh, low gain 320 uh, source imagery. And you can see by applying uh, the super resolution and denoising, we can uh, super resolve that all the way up to a 960 uh, format. You can see the dramatic reduction in noise and also the increase in spatial resolution. And then 
we can use a 640 and, and use upsampling um, uh, and improve the MTI and resolution in a source, uh, 640 source uh, video source. And then I'll, we're going to now talk about our, our, uh, our perception software, which we call NNTC, which is Neural Network Target Classifier. And before we start there, I just wanted to uh, talk about the taxonomy of, of detection, right? So we, uh, we have very general, uh, we generalize a lot of our uh, detection algorithms. So we'll do something like a, a vehicle detector. The vehicle has a broad, could represent you know, a very wide range of, of vehicle types. Uh, and then we can, we can go further discriminations into things like military vehicles, and then with enough pixels on target and having trained the network with enough training data of that particular class, we can then do a very fine-grained classification and identify things actually by specific make and model. And it's, it follows very similar to what we do in the human perception side, which is DRI, which is, you know, detect, recognize, and identify. Our focus has been on applications, so we have spent a lot of time in our AI investments and time and energy on building data sets so that we could train models, specifically in the thermal, where there hasn't been a tremendous amount of data and models, it's very difficult to generate models without thermal data. So we spent a lot of time developing and capturing and annotating and, cor and, uh, and creating very good data sets to train our networks. And this is just an example of just how much data we have. So in our ADAS data set, our training data set is up to like 2.4 million annotations. Our, our counter UAS uh, model has got over a million annotations in it. And our air to ground, which is our newest one, which we've been working on for about six months, we're, about, we're up to around 400,000 annotations. This is really, really where the, uh, a lot of effort has gone in because this is, the, the, this is really what drives the performance of, of, of AI. And we can augment this data, real data, with synthetic data. So uh, the division of FLIR has this synthetic tool and the ability to generate synthetic data so if there's if we have we have very sparse data in a particular class we can generate the synthetic data to help augment the, uh, the data sets that we have and that's a very unique capability and we have a crater with uh, with the army on that so there's a lot of momentum there and it's a, it's a very uh, exciting technology So part of NNTC is something called MTI, which is motion target indication. Um, and as you can see, there's a bounding box there. And this is before we get enough pixels on target to do a detection, but we do have MTI. So we can in fact alert the operator or the system that there's an object out there moving and that's MTI. And then as the target gets closer, enough pixels on target that we can do an object detector, then we can start uh, tracking the person with the bounding box and the uh, label, as in this case. And our network is designed or really optimized around small object detection. So we can detect a person uh, with a minimum size of around 16 pixels high and nine pixels wide. And again, in our ADAS a data set, you see here, we're blending and inside the uh, detection or in the object detector, we're putting thermal and we can mix. We have a lot of controls over how this gets displayed, uh, but you can just sort of just see just how high the performance is of, of the object detectors here across the 15 classes that we have in the ADAS data set. This is our new air to ground. And here you can see the performance of our ability to do uh, people and object detection or uh, vehicle detection. And again, because the perspective is so different, the glance angle is so different, we had to go out and collect new data. An important thing to understand about AI though, particularly as it relates to data, is that we do a lot of uh, base network training uh, and many people in industry might use uh, open source data sets like MS Coco. 
there is no commercial license available for MS Coco. So if you want to commercialize your net, your models and you've used uh, your pre, you pre-trained your network on any open source data set, you've got to make certain that there's a commercial license available. We have eliminated all of that data and we have completely trained our models with our own data and we can offer commercial licenses now. And again, more examples. And this is, this, all these videos are the actual output coming from the Qualcomm part that we are developing on. This is not coming on some super high performance laptop with a big NVIDIA GPU running it. This is all the data that's actually coming out of the RB5. And in our booth, we are running live uh, stored videos, but the videos that are displayed are not recordings of annotations. We're actually running the source videos through the RB5 and displaying the detections um, on, on the, in the exhibit. So you might want to take a look at that. The interesting thing here of the video on the left is as the person gets obscured by the trees, the MTI takes over so we can maintain some track. And uh, when there's enough pixels on target to reacquire, we do so. Am I at time? So here's a video of a fine grain classifier. And uh, as we go through this video, you'll see that as we zoom in, we get enough targets. We'll go you know, from, from vehicle to military target and we'll actually put a label on there that says T72. And the nice thing about the way the software works is that once we've acquired, uh, uh, once we've acquired, uh, depending on the fine grain classifier, once we have labeled it as uh, T72, even if we back away and we lose enough resolution to do an object, uh, a fine grain classification, the label will stay on target as long as the track ID is maintained. So that's all I had. I appreciate everyone's time. Again,